Episode 13, The Southern Tower Golden light glimmered on fresh snow, stained silver and red with gore. Pools of silver blood frozen to the cobblestones make warped reflections of shocked peasants as they wander about the cleared town square. Corpses are covered in once white cloth, lined up in rows. Sobbing can be heard from women and children over men's broken bodies. Guards stood above them all, grim expressions on wan faces. Guinevere slipped out of the inn early, promising to meet up with the others before they reached their planned destination of the day. It is like a decrepit corpse, strung up on a tree, Elidas said. It looms above us all, like the promise of death. Malara nodded. Fenyr glanced out the window. He could barely see the southern tower peeking over the roofs of the nearby buildings. The slate roof of the tower had caved in, and the rafters stuck out like ribs. It was a rather poetic description for something rather plain. Sure, the tower was in bad shape, but everything around it was rubble. Though it was strange that Matthias hadn't repaired the damage caused by the Northmen occupation 20 years ago. The mercenaries he had purchased shouldn't have drained his coffers that badly, even with the suitor infestation. Some nights ago, I met an old man who seemed oddly attracted to the tower as well, Malara said. He talked to something that wasn't there, called it Lord, and I don't think he was talking to God. She shivered, glancing nervously up at the tower. He would look to the tower as if it were the very being he spoke to. And so it was that they trekked out, to drive forth into the concealing snows and the now hidden ruins of the city. On their way, a sudden commotion started, as someone across the city square shouted, Gods! Gods! But seeing the men in black and red rush from the square to the source of the cries down an alley, the players decided to ignore the disruption. At the base of the tower they waited, and a few short minutes later, Guinevere trudged to join them. Now together they investigated the door at the base of the tower. Running up to the tower were strangely light footprints, left by a large boot that clearly wasn't from a snowshoe. The footprints moved from the snow, then through thick dust at the front of the door. Scratched on the door were the words, Within this tower, your words are no longer free, nor is your time. The door was unlocked. Elidas checked for sound at the door, and heard ruffling cloth and stomping boots. Opening the door and checking the inside was a disorienting experience. As the door swung inward, it revealed more and more of the richly furnished room. Unlike the outside, the inside was free of dust. A thick carpet was before the door for wiping one's feet. Velvety cushions rested on silken couches made of fine wood carvings. Short, stubby tables held books and steaming teas. Burned into the far door were the words, Open this with each letter separate from the last and underlined. The players carefully crept into the room. Jonathan and Malara read over the book's titles, as Fenier checked the door, finding it locked, and Elidas listened, hearing the footsteps now above them. The book's titles were Teaching the Young Their Letters, Letter by Letter How to Spell, and Reading Out Loud, thorough tutorial. Then something brushed their minds. All of them at once felt as if they had walked through a spider's web. Then it bit. A searing pain burst into their minds as memories flashed before their eyes. The thing that struck at them was searching for something. A few fought it off, their mental fortitude pushing away the probing fingers. 
others felt the thing take secrets from them, an unnerving feeling washed through those that failed. Those were dark secrets. They rushed from the room as Malara uncorked a concoction made from some of the venom of the dragon and the acidic vomit from some of the zombies they had fought in Bivio. The potion melted the lock on the door, but as it did, Malara heard a bestial growl. Beyond the door is an empty staircase. A small amount of dust is slightly disturbed on the stairs. The players rushed up the stairs to the next floor. As they ascended, Malara heard, I do not like you skipping over my tests. And the fact that my reward must still be given bothers me all the more. Then in all of their heads, the voice whispered a secret. Matthias did not come to his army. It came to him. About halfway up the stairs, the party came across a few dead rats. Puzzled, they muse over them, before using them to cure the headaches caused by the stolen memories. The next floor was coated in bookshelves, and a single pedestal was before the door to the next floor. Small chairs dotted the room. Within, the players rapidly found that the books all only contained one letter, and that the door was locked. As spiders' fingers strike their minds, they stacked the books on the pedestal, spelling open, unlocking the door. The dust thickened as they slipped up the stairs. More rats were found, and the voice whispered, Clarence took the last cookie. Who's Clarence? asked Malara. Haven't a clue said Fenyr. The next room had cobwebs in its corners, and the wooden floor was coated in dust. A simple cipher was carved into the door of 1 equals A, 2 equals B, etc. Within the room are five pedestals, four in a row from the left side of the room to the right, the last before the others. The closest pedestal had a stack of cards, revealed shortly to be the major arcana of a tarot deck. Seeing a pattern, the players quickly placed the devil on the first pedestal to the left, then the tower, the hierophant, and temperance on the next three in sequence. The door opened, and they were allowed to continue. The next whisper was, Howard had his sons eaten by ghouls. Not knowing a Howard, the party ignored the whisper, hoping that their own secret was not shared. The fourth floor was covered in cobwebs and was broken down by damage from the room above. The wall containing the stairs was clearly broken, and the puzzle within the room destroyed. It was noted that the entrance to the bloody sewer could not be seen from the hole within the tower, even while looking directly at the spot where it should have been. Ascending these stairs was easy, yet still the party was awarded with the whisper, Jekyll is hiding something. Thick vines hold a crumbling floor together and burrow through walls to choke the room. The vines pour in dense patches through windows and arrow slits. A heavy miasma made breathing difficult and appeared to have chased off the spiders. Fenyr strode ahead and the others followed more cautiously, only for both Elidus and Guinevere to trip and tangle themselves in the vines. Panicking as probes of the secret stealer began to touch their minds, they hack at the vines. Thick. Crimson blood gushed from the plant as they hacked and scrambled, only to retangle themselves. The last whisper, too, is deemed unimportant. As they gain the second-to-last floor, the door into the floor read, I can count to 1,023 on two of your human hands. 
How high can you? The following room is full of dust and cobwebs. Its door has inscribed on it. If A equals a depiction of a hand, palm forward and thumb out, and B equals a depiction of a hand, palm forward, that points upwards with its index finger. Can you spell open? Counting suggests the previous number-based cipher, Fenyer said. Making the thumb one and the index finger two, said Guinevere. If that is true, three would be both index finger and thumb. Four is likely middle finger, as you lower thumb and raise index finger to make two. Lowering the index finger and thumb while raising the middle finger should be four, said Elidas. This process should repeat. Their minds split as knowledge was scoured from them. They counted on their fingers, slowly finding O, 15, with only the pinky lowered, P, 16, with only the pinky raised, E, 5, with the middle and thumb raised, and lastly, N, 14, with the pinky and thumb lowered. This opened the door letting them up to the next floor and releasing them from their mental torments. Several dead cats were found on the stairs to help them relieve their headaches, but not cure them. Low whispers were heard above as they tried to sneak up on the conversing men. Standing alone in the room is an old man with burning candles on his head. The hot wax flowed into his unblinking eyes. His cloak seemed to whip in wind that did not blow in the closed room. He turned, glaring suspiciously at the party. With the candles and the cloak, it is obvious what the man was. A watchman. A religious military leader of the Ministry of the Midnight Watch. One of the greatest and most terrible of Tandem's warriors. Guinevere tapped Fenyr's shoulder excitedly. Then she whispered, It is him. He who has wronged me. We have not the strength to battle a watchman, Fenyr whispered back, leaving Guinevere to brew. The watchman cocked an eyebrow, pushing Boltant and breaking hardened wax. What brings you here, Kraken Man? He snarled. City is in turmoil. I wish to protect grandma and sister. We seek power. The man glanced back to Malara and Elidus, then glared back to Fenyr. His blade appeared in his hand as if it had never been sheathed. Turmoil? He asked. Women, including my sister, have disappeared, and all God do is party in woods. Recipe? For bad times. You're not a fan of the god. Alexander think Vada kidnapped my sister. Vada claimed to know of her, but requires me to earn his trust. I believe he has kidnapped my sister, Fenyr declared. My hounds tracked my sister's scent to the map, and he had the gall to say that it was none of my business when I asked him about it. Now he forces me to fight his men if I want the knowledge he keeps. You have moved me, the watchman said, his blade vanishing once more. You have demonstrated your opposition to the High Lord's men. I would like to request your aid. I plan to strike the brute as he drinks himself silly at the next of his bodies. Your support there would be beneficial. We were planning to be there anyway, said Fenyr. He raised his hand. I'm Fenyr, dogman in your language. With a gnarled, bony hand, the watchman took the handshake. Damascus. The watchman departed, gliding down the stairs and keeping eye contact with the party as he walked backwards. Lydus and Malara seemed distracted by something. A sigh came from within the room. 
Fenyr and Guinevere turned to find the room empty, but for the party. The voice that had whispered secrets to them spoke. Finally, I thought he'd stab one of you up good before leaving. Anyway, I'll answer one of your questions. Oh, and an unlimited number of bullshit questions till you ask a real one. One question for each of us? Or for all of us? Asked Guinevere. See? Bullshit question. All right, all. Then, understanding the situation, they discussed what question they wanted answered, and came to a conclusion. Where are the places of dark power in and around the city? asked Fenyr. Here, the oblix with the shaman, the pit in the middle of the ruined part of the city, the halls beneath the church, oh, and the Pent family tomb. Now be gone. Fenyr, Jonathan, and Guinevere are moved out of the room by the room stretching and squashing around them. Malar and Elida spared a glance for Fenyr, Jonathan, and Guinevere as they seemed to slide out of the room before they fled down the stairs. But they daren't turn for long. Seven fingered hands wrapped around their shoulders. Look here, the creature said, pointing with one of its many gnarled hands. When they peered out the window, the walls of the tower collapsed. Outside, a large black bird with a message arrived and gave Jonathan a letter. It's from the High Lord, he signed excitedly. An invitation for us all to dinner at the High Lady Visenia's request. We are each permitted an additional guest of our choosing. I must apologize, my companions. I have much to prepare. Then Jonathan ran off to prepare his meeting with a fellow nobleman. From the top of the tower, Elidas and Malara watched as the sky bled red. Seven winged figures swarmed the castle as a full moon rose. Fire glinted from red eyes mounted on the joints of webbed wings. Blood flowed in great rivers down streets. They fly around something larger, deeper, darker. And the dark swallowed the moon. Blood and dread then rule the land. Then, slowly the vision cleared, revealing another. The sun shone in a blue sky. People wander about the clear streets. The ruined part of town is rebuilt. On the drawbridge of the castle is a shorter, well-muscled man. He smiled as the sun glittered in his red eyes. His short black hair is swept back, and his fine clothes are spattered with paint. Then the visions faded, with it the paranoia that had directly or indirectly brought Elidus and Malar here. Only for the devouring fear to slowly creep back.